Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, as Barack said, I'm Caroline Bartman in the lab of Arjun Raj and Gary Global at the University of Pennsylvania. And I've been studying how uh, transcription is regulated and specifically how transcriptional bursting might be an important regulated step of transcription. So as you all know, transcriptional regulation is very important uh, for choosing cell fate. Um, for example, when a stem cell differentiates into a red blood cell, that red blood cell needs to turn up a number of red blood cell specific genes in order for the cell to carry out its function. For example, like beta globin, which is a subunit of hemoglobin, where if that stem cell were to become a B cell, it would have to turn up B cell genes. So how could this happen? One way we could think about this is that there are a certain number of knobs that have to get turned up during differentiation. So a gene like beta globin would start out off in a stem cell, and then if you turn up these genes, then if you turn up a certain number of transcriptional knobs, now that RNA is able to be produced. But we wanted to know how many knobs do you really have to turn in order to get a gene to turn on? So here is a very simple model that synthesizes a lot of the thought in the field. So there have been many studies on transcriptional regulation, many ideas about different steps that could be regulated, but two of the really key steps that seem to be important uh, are shown here. So first, polymerase has to bind the promoter of a gene. Uh, and the speed of polymerase recruitment to that gene can be facilitated by, say, enhancer activity, by transcription factor binding at promoters and enhancers. Uh, once that polymerase is bound to a gene, then it can initiate, uh, but near the promoter, that polymerase gets paused uh, and requires the kinase complex PTFB to come in and phosphorylate the polymerase in order that it can elongate and produce an RNA molecule. And we know that polymerase pausing is really a globally important step uh, because if we use a pharmacologic inhibitor to inhibit PTFB, then transcription is globally arrested at all genes. So uh, again, going back to the conceit of knobs, we could think of these as two different knobs that have to get turned up uh, to get a gene to transcribe. And note that even though the rate of binding and then the rate of release from pausing are independent knobs, you would have to turn both of them up to get transcription. Uh, if you have no binding, it doesn't matter how high the release knob is turned up. Okay, but it's possible that this model with just two knobs is too simplistic, uh, and there might be more knobs involved. And so one line of evidence that there are more knobs comes from single cell imaging of transcription. So this is a figure from a recent paper from Mike Levine's lab in which they visualize nascent RNA transcription uh, live over time. And what you can see here is that nascent RNA is not produced kind of evenly over time. Rather, it's produced in pulses or bursts. And so you can see here that at one of these peaks, many nascent RNAs are being produced, whereas then when you enter this trough, uh, no nascent RNAs are produced. So that could imply that apart from the binding and pause release steps of transcription, there's sort of uh, another set of steps flanking those that we'll call burst initiation and burst termination. And I want to point out that these steps have been intuited from the phenomenon of bursting, but we really don't understand what their molecular basis would be. So I'll talk about that more later. So how could this slightly more complex model work? It could be the case that when you're at one of these peaks, uh, a burst has initiated, and that now allows RNA to be produced. Whereas if you're in this trough, what has happened is that the burst has terminated, and even though these binding and pause release knobs are turned up, the rates are high, but yet that gene is not available for transcription. And you can imagine that if we turn down this first knob of burst initiation rate, you could turn down transcription because the gene would be available for transcription more rarely, even though you haven't altered the rates of binding or pause release. 
So how can we get at this question of whether burst initiation is a regulated rate of transcription? So the approach we decided to take uh, was a mathematical modeling approach. So we set up mathematical models either for the two-step model that just includes polymerase binding and release, and then one for the four-step model that I'm depicting here. And so then what we did is we picked a value for each of the four rates in this model. We then ran stochastic simulations on a thousand gene copies. So uh, each gene copy starts out at the beginning of the simulation in a transcriptionally unavailable state. Then it can, each copy can undergo burst initiation. It'll undergo initiation uh, with a greater rate if that rate value is higher, with a slower rate if the rate value is lower. Once the burst has initiated, that gene copy can bind polymerase. Again, the rate of that binding will be determined by the polymerase binding rate value. Then the bound polymerase can undergo pause release and make an RNA. Those steps could potentially happen multiple times, and then the gene will undergo a termination rate. And so we run this simulation of 1,000 gene copies over time. And from this information, we can make predictions about experimental measures. So, for example, pull 2 chip seq we can predict by looking at the average position of polymerase in that 1,000 gene copy. So how many polymerases are bound at the promoter and then the gene body in this simulation. And then we can also predict nascent transcript RNA fish measurements. I'll discuss the specifics of this more later, but basically it's a single cell method to measure whether a gene has recently made uh, nascent RNA. And so from this set of simulations, we can predict what that should look like. So I described one set of simulations with one set of values, but we'll vary each of those individual values through a thousand-fold range. And that'll give us the information, if I change one rate, what should happen to pull 2 chip seek value? What should happen to nascent transcript RNA fish? And so here's an example of what those predictions look like. If I change, if I reduce burst initiation rate, this model predicts that the average amount of pole 2 at a gene should be decreased. And so I can make this kind of prediction for changing each individual rate, and then I can make them for a number of different experimental measures. I'll go into the specific measures I'm using more later, uh, but pole 2 chip seek and nascent transcript RNA fish measures. So, Constructing this model this way and running th these simulations gave us a number of powerful predictions about how to understand transcriptional regulation that I'm going to go ahead and test. So the first question we wanted to answer, again, is, is burst initiation a regulated step, or can we stick with this simpler model with only two steps? And so to, our model said that nascent transcript RNA fish could distinguish a change in burst initiation from a change in any other rate. So what is nascent transcript RNA fish? Uh, it uses fluorescently labeled probes to label the introns of a gene of interest. And since when an RNA is transcribed, the introns are quickly spliced out a couple minutes after transcription. So imaging with this sort of probes allows us to have quantitative measure of recent transcription in single cells. And the measurements that we get from that I'm showing here. So uh, one is active transcribing fraction. So how many gene copies have recently made that type of nascent RNA? In this toy example, two of the five gene copies have recently made RNA. Then the other measure is nascent RNA intensity. So how many nascent RNAs has each active copy made? So this one has made one, so you see uh, a smaller fluorescent spot in the nucleus. This one has made two, so you'd see a larger spot. So in this toy example, the nascent RNA intensity is 1.5. So how can we use those measurements to see if burst initiation rate is changing? If we change polymerase binding rate, I'm showing from on the left, there's a lower rate, and then on the right, a higher rate of polymerase binding. What you would see is more binding events happening over time. If the rate is low, binding events are very rare. 
uh, if the binding rate is high, binding events are very frequent. And we can measure that because uh, if rates are very low, you'll mostly see no transcription and maybe a rare dim spot of transcription for a single RNA. If the rate is high, you'll see uh, a higher active transcribing fraction and you'll see uh, these spots also tend to be brighter. So that's shown here. We would predict that active transcribing fraction and then the number of RNAs made in each event should increase in tandem. Conversely, if we increase the burst initiation rate instead, you see a different pattern. So the gene will be, well, if the burst initiation rate is low, the gene becomes transcriptionally available only very rarely. Whereas if the initiation rate is high, now there are more transcriptional bursts. However, the number of RNAs produced by each burst is not predicted to change. So in this case, you'll see an increase in active transcribing fraction. So uh, the average number of transcription events, but you'll see no change in nascent RNA intensity. So we now went to experimental data to see, can we see that pattern happening with actual experimental perturbation? Here's one example. We used a BET inhibitor drug, uh, which blocks the chromatin binding of the activator proteins BRD2, 3, and 4. And so looking at the beta globin gene in erythroid cells, uh, these green sites are nascent RNA fish, uh, measuring nascent transcripts of beta globin. What you can see on the left, there are many transcription sites. On the right, there are fewer, uh, but they are just as bright. So the nascent RNA intensity is equivalent, even when you treat with that drug. And I'm quantifying that here for three biological replicates. Uh, the fraction of gene copies transcribing goes down by about threefold, but the nascent RNA intensity is unchanged. And to remind you again, the model predicted uh, that we would only see that particular pattern if a uh, burst initiation rate is changed. Uh, the independent change of active transcribing fraction with no change in nascent RNA intensity. So this is really exciting. We can already say that burst initiation rate can be a regulated step of transcription and that this simple two-step model can be rejected. So we want to do an important control, which is that our model says we can tell apart uh, a change in burst initiation from a change in binding rate. So to address that control, we use the drug triptolide, which is known to reduce polymerase binding to the promoter. And what we saw experimentally is that for five genes that I tested, both the active transcribing fraction is decreased as well as the nascent RNA intensity. And again, that is consistent with a change in binding rate because both measures are going down together. Uh, whereas if burst initiation rate were changing, as I showed earlier, the nascent RNA intensity would not change. So this is really reassuring. We can use uh, nascent transcript RNA fish to tell apart changes in these two rates. So we saw one example of burst initiation rate being regulated, but could it happen in more cases? And what is really going on with that regulation? So we examined many more perturbations uh, to see if we could see a change in burst initiation rate. I'm showing one here. So we used a system to uh, specifically increase contacts between the beta globin enhancer and promoter. And we did this by expressing a synthetic looping factor, which binds to the promoter of beta globin and dimerizes with a protein present at the enhancer. And what we saw in this case is that active transcribing fraction was strongly increased uh, but nascent RNA intensity was not changed. And so again, uh, we can say that enhancer promoter looping specifically controls burst initiation rate rather than any other step of transcription. Another manipulation we tried uh, was a transient increase in transcription factor levels of the key erythroid transcription factor GATA1. So um, we have a cell line that has a GATA1 estradiol receptor fusion. Uh, and by treating with estradiol, we stabilize that transcription factor and raise its levels. 
And we can see that for two early induced genes, beta globin and PRDX2, that active transcribing fraction is increased, whereas nascent RNA intensity is decreased. So again, transcription factor levels uh, can increase specifically burst initiation rate. So just to go over what I've shown you so far, we've used quantitative modeling and experiments to show that burst initiation is an important regulated step of transcription and that we can use nascent transcript RNA fish to tell apart changes in binding rate from burst initiation rate. This is really important because with a bulk method like pol 2 chipseq or GrowSeq, these two steps are indistinguishable. They, decreasing either of them would just decrease the amount of polymerase that reaches a gene on average in a population. So you need a single cell measure to be able to tell those steps apart. Uh, and I've shown that promoter enhancer looping and increased transcription factor levels can control burst initiation rate. So the step that I haven't really discussed is polymerase pause release rate, which is also thought to be an important regulatory step of transcription. So nascent transcript RNA fish actually can't measure changes in that step, so we turn to pull 2 chip seek, which can. What I'm showing here is the model prediction saying that measuring the pull 2 traveling ratio, so the ratio between polymerase elongating in the gene versus at the promoter, uh, can measure changes in the pause release rate very specifically because a change in traveling ratio does not occur uh, with changes in any of the other rates of transcription. And here is just sort of a schematic for the intuition for that. Uh, you can see if this is the base state where many polymerases are paused, stuck at the promoter, and a few are elongating, if you increase the pause release rate, the total amount of polymerase shouldn't really change, uh, but you have more polymerase that's downstream in the gene body and less that's paused at the promoter. So that traveling ratio is increased. So to confirm that this really can measure a change in the polymerase pause release rate, we used an inhibitor that specifically reduces pause release rate, flavopurinol. Uh, and so the prediction is that we should see a decreased uh, pull to traveling ratio. And indeed, that's what we see. So we're looking at the 740 genes that are still transcribed after this treatment because we can't look at traveling ratio in genes that are totally off. Uh, but what you see here is the traveling ratio is significantly decreased for those genes by uh, flavopyridol treatment. And in contrast, if we go back to the tripsilide treatment, which affects polymerase binding rate, that does not change traveling ratio. And similarly, if we look back at forced enhancer promoter looping, which changes initiation rate, that also doesn't change traveling ratio. And uh, earlier, I showed you that you can distinguish these two changes uh, using nascent transcript RNA fish. So first initiation can be a regulatory step of transcription. Promoter enhancer looping and transcription factor binding can control burst initiation rate. And we've shown with this very powerful model that we can use two different experimental paradigms and in combination we can tell apart changes in burst initiation rate, polymerase binding rate, and pause release rate. So in this talk, I basically set up this model for you. We have applied it to a number of different perturbations uh, to see which rates are changing, including more complex perturbations where more than one rate is changing at the same time. I'll just give you a little taste of that. So I told you that when we increase GATA1 levels for four hours, that the beta globin gene is increased in burst initiation rate. So it turns out that if you continue keeping the levels of GATA1 high in these cells, uh, they undergo erythroid differentiation. Uh, so the cells get smaller, they undergo cell cycle arrest, and they upregulate all the erythroid genes and undergo hemoglobinization. And so if we continue down this differentiation pathway, uh, so many more hours of GATA1 addition, you can see that the total amount of polymerase goes up, but 
the polymerase at the end of the gene is highly enriched compared to the promoter. So this particular gene is transcribing from right to left. So the traveling ratio is going up at this time point. So at this later time point, pause release rate is increased. So that's showing us that for this gene, erythroid differentiation can affect both initiation rate and pause release rate. So we've done that sort of study on many more genes and showed that both BET inhibition and erythroid differentiation can change first initiation rate and pause release rate. And strikingly, we found that polymerase binding rate really wasn't changed by any of the perturbations we looked at except for triptolide. So there are many future directions for this work. One that we're really excited about in the lab is we're optimizing a technique to sort transcribing cells from non-transcribing cells just in an unperturbed population. And then we'd like to do biochemical methods like CHIP and 3C to see what is bound at a gene while it's bursting versus not bursting. And so this is just the takeaway that I want you to remember from the talk, which is that uh, if we're trying to understand how transcription is regulated, how a gene is turned up during differentiation, the two main steps that get changed are first initiation rate and polymerase pause release rate. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, people from both my lab, the Raj lab and Global lab, as well as our collaborators, the Hardison lab. Thanks. <laughs>